right, well, good evening. Good to see everyone out this evening. Thank you for being here in the house of the Lord. Let's go ahead and get started with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to be in your house, to worship, and to praise you. Lord, we ask for your presence to be in our presence this evening. Lord, we ask that you would speak to our hearts and give us exactly what we need to hear tonight, Lord, to help us better serve you, and Lord, that we would give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor that comes from it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's grab a hymnal, turn to page 217, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Uh, and the last on this one.
Amen. Take this opportunity and welcome one another to services. as you return to your seat, page number 187. house and uh, good to have one of my friends with us this evening. Dean is with us and appreciate him coming and visiting our church tonight and appreciate our home folk being here as well. We're going to continue our study in Genesis, Genesis chapter 29 this evening. We're going to be in Genesis chapter number 29 
by way of review, uh, we said the first, uh, the first 11 chapters of Genesis covers around 2,000, period, uh, 2000 years of time. And it covers four major events. So four major events is the, uh, is the uh, creation, the fall, the flood, and the Tower of Babel. And then we said Genesis chapter 12 through Genesis chapter 50 covers about 350 years. And there's four major uh, people that are, four major men that are mentioned in this, uh, these chapters. And it's uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And tonight we're going to be in Genesis chapter 29. I like Genesis chapter 29. I read one commentator that said that this could be uh, likely titled uh, Chickens Come Home to Roost. And if you've read Genesis chapter 29, you'll understand uh, here in just a few moments about that. But I've also uh, looked at Genesis chapter 29, and it reminds me of Galatians chapter number 6, verses 7 and 8. The Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For if he that, he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And uh, you'll get to understand this, this, why I say this alludes to that uh, in just a few moments. In the beginning of this chapter, we'll see that Jacob begins to reap the harvest of his evil doings. We remember as we studied through the life of, of Jacob, we understand that he's a deceiver. He's one a trickster. He's very arrogant, very uh, uh, boisterous about his, uh, his trickery and the, and the things that he does. And this passage of Galatians is written primarily uh, to Christians, uh, but it expresses, um, uh, expresses uh, the universal of law to every, everything. I mean, this law of reaping and sowing and sowing and reaping, uh, it's true in every area of our life. Uh, think about this. You sow corn, you reap corn. Uh, you sow cotton, you reap cotton. Uh, if you sow wheat, you're going to reap wheat. And the same thing is if we, uh, in our spiritual lives, if we uh, sow to the Spirit, we're going to reap of the Spirit. If we sow of the flesh, we're going to reap of the flesh. Examples of this principle runs all through the Bible. If you read through, you'll see this over and over again. For instance, think about Pharaoh. What did Pharaoh do? He slew the male children of the Hebrews, and uh, in time, his own son was slew, his firstborn son was slew by the death angel. Uh, uh, another one, Ahab, through false accusation, had Naboth slain, and uh, the dogs licked uh, his blood, and God sent the prophet Elijah to Ahab with uh, the message that he also would have, the dogs would also lick his blood, and it literally came to pass. And you'll remember David. David found out this was very true in his life. He, he committed uh, terrible sins, and his, uh, he, raped, he reaped what he had sown. His family was a mess. His, uh, his life was a mess because of the life that he sowed. Uh, even Paul the Apostle, think about this, the Apostle Paul, he held the, uh, the papers for Stephen to be stoned. He held, he held those, uh, the coats and the papers for, uh, for Stephen to be stoned, yet uh, later on Paul was taken outside the city of Lystra and, and uh, was stoned and left for dead. I mean, you see it over and over and over and over. Uh, someone says, what goes around comes around. And that's this, the story that's going on in the life of Jacob here. We'll see that in just a moment. And Jacob is a classic illustration of this law. Jacob had, had lived by uh, his wits, he, he, his cleverness, his, his arrogancy, and uh, his trickery. And uh, he, was, he was arrogant, but he was quite clever in the way he did things, how he accomplished things. He had practiced deceit very well. Maybe you've known people that could... Uh, lie and ha have you convinced of their lies. They were even convinced themselves of their lies. Uh, that's Jacob here. He, he is a deceiver. He's one uh, that would done it very well. He would stoop down to use uh, any uh, shady method uh, uh, to accomplish his purpose. Whatever he had to do to accomplish his will, his purpose, he would stoop down to the lowest levels to get that accomplished. And he was proud of his cleverness. He was proud of this. But he will reap what he has sown. 
I want to look at three words this evening and we'll have the message. We're going to pray and then we'll get into the message this evening. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for once again for allowing us to be in your house to worship and to praise you. Lord, as we open up Genesis chapter 29 this evening, Lord, I pray that you would use this uh, chapter and help it apply it to our lives, Lord, that we would uh, learn from this uh, Jacob and and learn uh, some things that I believe he learned in this 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 story. And Lord, I pray that we would uh, just get what we need to help us get through the week. And uh, Lord, thank you for all that you do. If there's one here, uh, either in our presence or listening over the internet or whatever the case, if they're here, uh, Lord, they don't know you. I pray that today will be the day of salvation. And Lord, I pray that you would speak the hearts of your people. Draw us nigh to you. Lord, help us to love you and serve you out of uh, a, a heart of love and out of a desire to, uh, of love, uh, not out of obligation, but out of love. Thank you again for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, as we come to this chapter, Jacob is now, he's left Bethel, and he resumes his journey back uh, going to Haran. And, and at this, after this time, we are, we're not sure how long the time it is but, that he traveled, but he got to Haran. And this is where we pick up the story in Genesis 29, verses 1 through 3 here, just a moment. The Bible says, Then Jacob went on his journey and came into the land of the people of the east. And he looked, and behold, a well in the field. And lo, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks. And a great stone was upon the well's mouth, and thither were all the flocks gathered. And they rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered this, the sheep and put the stone again upon the well's mouth in his place. We see here the importance of water in this country. Water is a commodity that is much needed in every area. It's very important and there's uh, often a shortage of water. So they had to protect uh, the water supply that they had. Uh, that is why at a certain time during the day there was a stone that was rolled upon that uh, that well's mouth and then it was removed uh, at the top of the mouth. It was uh, removed from certain times of the day to protect that water and uh, so when it was removed everybody would uh, water their sheep, water their animals and everybody would get all the water that they needed at the time and then the stone was put back on the mouth uh, of the, the well there. Now Jacob arrives on the scene in his arrogant fashion and, and he, uh, he takes the stone away uh, uh, from the well. Look there in verse 4 and 5. It says, And Jacob said unto them, My brethren, whence be ye? He's kind of walking up to him. You can get the picture here. He's kind of walking up. He says, Hey, fellas, uh, who are y'all? And uh, he, he said, uh, Of Haran are we. They said, Of Haran uh, are we. And he said unto them, Know ye Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. And so he goes in, he's saying, hey, I'm looking for Laban. Uh, uh, did, do you guys know who he is? And they said, oh, yes, we know who he is. I, I kind of imagine, just because we read in later on to the story, Laban probably had a name for himself. Probably not a name that would be desired, one that we would, uh, we would think that we would want uh, attached to our name. And they said, yeah, we know who who Laban is. However, Jacob didn't know who Laban was, but he's about to find out real quick who Laban is. Look there in verse 6 and 7. It says, And he said unto them, Is he well? And they said, He is well. And behold, Rachel his daughter cometh with the sheep. And he said, Lo, it is yet high day, neither is it time that the cattle should be gathered together. Water ye the sheep, and go and feed them. So, you get this story right here. Now, Jacob comes on the scene and he's saying, hey, okay, you guys go ahead and get your water and uh, go ahead and go move on. He's kind of got this arrogancy about him. He, he knows what he's doing. He's, he's coming in from a far land, not even knowing anybody in the area. He's like, okay, you guys go ahead and water your, your cattle here and then just move on. Like he has some... Like he has the authority to tell people what to do or something. Here Jacob has arrived on the, in the land and he's telling them how to water their sheep and how to take care of their flocks and how to do it and what to do and when to do it. This is typical form of Jacob here. And uh, uh, then look there in verse 8. It says, And they said, We cannot until all the flocks be gathered together until they roll the stone from the well's mouth. 
Then we water the sheep. Now, here's, they're, they're telling them, hey, Jacob, this is how we have to do this. So we'll read on. And I want to show, I want to share with you three words tonight and we'll have the message. Number one, the first word I want you to notice is love. Love. Now, for Jacob, marriage was not an option. It was, it was an obligation. It was something that had to happen. The success of the covenant promise God gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, hinged on the fact that they would get married and they would have children. Why? Because that was the covenant promise that they would have many children the, uh, as far as the uh, sands of the sea and all, all, uh, all the stars in the sky and all the, these covenant promise that he said. So it was contingent on him finding a bride and them finding a bride uh, because this would eventually become the people of Israel and, and the nation that would bring the promised redeemer into the world. So Jacob met Rachel here. And I believe when Jacob met Rachel, his eyes popped out of his head. I mean, I just got this. I, I mean, come on. Would you get, give me a little bit here? I believe he thought she was just one hot tamale, okay? I mean, she was a babe. And he's just like, kind of like when I look at my wife, just, you know, I mean, lights just flashing and everything else. And uh, but that's what that's what I kind of imagine what happens to Jacob here. He is I mean, he is in love. He sees her and he's like, I've got to have her. And so we read on here and uh, verse nine, it says, and while he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep for she kept them. Rachel is a, a shepherdess at this time and. Uh, she was one that took care of the sheep, and this was often uh, the lady's job in that day. Then read in verse 10, it says, And it came to pass, when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his bro mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. I kind of got this picture. Here's, here's Jacob, and he's like, so I'm going to show her how tough of a man I am. We're kind of like us guys when we try to win our wives. You know, we're like wanting to show off, maybe rev our engine of our car. Back in the, your day, Brother Greg, you had that hot rod, and you just vroom, vroom, and then you just thought you had her right then, didn't you? You knew it was right then. That's exactly what, the, what she liked, and show off the big muscles and all this stuff. And that's exactly what Jacob's doing. He rolls back the rock. Now this rock, it, the Bible teaches that this rock was not just a, a little stone. It was a mighty rock. And so he, he goes and he, he, he rolls the stone away. Now no one told him to do this. He probably did this to impress Rachel. And Jacob is not following anybody's law but his own. Remember that they had to wait until all the flocks came in. Uh, to protect the water, to preserve the water. But he made his own rules to the game and as he went through life, and that is the first part of his life, and then we'll read on a little bit more about his life later on. He has tremendous lesson to learn, and Uncle Laban's about to teach him in the school of hard knocks. Look there in verse 11. It says, And Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. That must have been some kind of kiss, I'm telling you right now. I mean, can you imagine that? I kissed, I, I, I kissed my wife, but I didn't cry. Now, when she kissed, when I kissed her, she started crying. She, and it wasn't because she was like, wow. She was like, what have I done? I think that's what it was. I'm not sure. But anyways, that must have been some kind of kiss. And, uh, uh, but I, I believe it was probably because of a few things. It's, one, he was on an emotional journey. He had just left his mother, remember, he was, he was tied to her apron strings and, and kind of just uh, was right there with her the whole time of her life. Now he's away from her. But also, if you remember back in Bethel, that God gave him the promise. Remember the promise? He told him he, said he was going to pass this promise on from uh, Abraham, Isaac, now to Jacob. Now Jacob has that promise, and now I believe the reason why uh, he, cry, he cried out was maybe it was because now he's starting to turn over uh, living a different life and saying you know what God is fulfilling his promise God is coming through with what he's have you ever experienced that in your life 
when God has come through and with a promise in your life and you just couldn't help but just weep? I mean, you've seen God's hand all over something. You're like, I didn't know how this was going to happen, but God, you came through. And that's kind of what I think can happen here. Maybe that, uh, maybe he's seeing that Rachel is God's plan for his life. I don't know. But then we notice there in verse 12, it says, And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's brother and that he was Re uh, Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. You'll notice that he calls himself her, her father's brother. Now, he wasn't lying to her. In the Hebrew, uh, what they did back then, uh, they didn't make a lot of distinctions like we do today. My cousins, uncles, nephews, cousins, brothers, that wasn't what, if you were family, that was your, your brother. And that's, uh, that was the way it was. And uh, in English, we would say that Jacob was her father's nephew and that he was the son of Rebecca, her father's sister. We would say something of that sort. Or that Laban was his uncle. Okay, that's the easiest way to, to say it. Now, the scene at the well, it kind of reminds me of an experience of Abraham's servant. You remember back when we were talking about Abraham's servant finding a wife for Isaac? He prayed and he asked God for God's direction and God sent him right to the right person at the right time. And he said, hey, make this be the one. And, and if uh, the person that says, let me feed thy, uh, drink, uh, uh, give water to thy camels as well and, and let them drink and all this stuff. And it kind of reminds me of that scene. However, there's no record that Jacob prayed as his grandfather's servant did. But perhaps he prayed the whole way. Perhaps that he prayed for God's guidance and he was praying the whole time saying, now, this is, I'm just, uh, this is a Rickyism. It's not, it's not Bible. This is just my thoughts uh, of the matter, okay? I want you to understand that. This is not what thus saith the Lord, okay? But I'm, I'm kind of giving me a little bit of liberty here and saying, maybe he was praying and saying, God, show me this person. Maybe from the time in Bethel, he, he was starting to mature a little bit in the Lord. I'm not sure. But I get the impression that when Jacob saw Rachel, it was love at first sight. If so, it explains why he tried to get the shepherds to water their flocks and leave, because he wanted Rachel all to himself at their first meeting. The stone that covered the well was large and heavy, but Jacob was able to move it so he could water Rachel's flocks. When he introduced himself, she ran to tell Laban the news in the ancient East, family ties were very strong, and visiting relatives, including those you've never met before, were, uh, uh, would be entertained as, uh, in the home as your own flesh and blood. I mean, it'd be like uh, you know, uh, someone's brother or sister coming into town. That, that's how welcoming it should be. Uh, maybe you've got family members... Uh, you don't want to come to town or whatever, but uh, maybe you've got some family members that you enjoy coming to town, and you put them up in their house, and you know you say, "Hey, make yourself feel at home," and that's what ha what is happening here. Uh, we see the providence of God in this meeting. Jacob could have borrowed words from Isaac's servant when he Isaac's servant said this: "I being in the way, the Lord led me." He could have used those words because God was leading and directing in his life. Unbelievers might call this event a fortunate coincidence. I don't believe things happen by coincidence. You know, I, I, there's been times when maybe in your life, in my life, when I was going down the street and, uh, man, something would, something would happen to my car. And I, I, I can remember this happening not to, uh, when I was working at Great Dane. I was on my way to work, and my truck just all of a sudden broke down. Would not start for 10 minutes. I'm sitting there monkeying around with it. I had no idea what I'm looking at. I'm not a mechanic. I, know that. I don't even know where to even start. And I'm looking at that, and I'm just wiggling wires, and I'm like, come on, I don't want to be late to work. And I'm looking at it, and then all of a sudden I get in my truck after about 10 minutes of just staring at it like a deer at a new gate, and I'm, I'm just staring at it, and I'm like, I don't know. I go in and I start it up and that thing just fires and I just thought I was a top mechanic at that point. 
I thought, man, just throw me any job out there. I can do it. And then I'm on my way, and just as soon as I go by there, there's an accident that was on the, on the side of the road. My same path. Guess what? It happened about 10 minutes before I went there. Someone might say that's a coincidence. I don't think it was a coincidence. I believe it was God's hand, God's protection. And God does things like that all the time, things that we never even see or we even give him credit for. But in the life of a trusting Christian, there are no accidents, only divine appointments. Look there in verse 13, it says, And it came to pass, when Laban heard the tidings of Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his, ho- to his house, and t- he told Laban all these things. Now, at first, this sounds like, man, Laban is, he is one that he, he's excited about seeing his nephew. He, I think he is excited. He's got somebody else he can deceive here. Imagine that Jacob, I imagine that Jacob had quite a bit to talk about. I, I believe he probably poured out his heart to Laban, telling him all the things that happened back uh, with his family and, and you know how he deceived his brother Esau and, and how he was on his way and maybe he ran across uh, some different things and different occasions and maybe what happened in Bethel. I, I believe it because the Bible says this, and he told Laban all these things. There was no shortage of entertainment at this point. I believe he, he told him at the dinner table, he told him everything that had befallen him, and he wasn't short of any words. Look there in verse 14, it says, And Laban said to him, Surely thou art my bone and my flesh. And he abode with him the space of a month. He says, Hey, you're my, you're my brother, you're my family. Come on into my house. Take your shoes off, relax. My castle is your castle. You, you, you just uh, make yourself at home. Look there in verse 15. It says, And Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother, shouldest thou ser- therefore serve me for naught? Tell me, what shall thy s- wages be? Jacob has met his match finally. Laban is clever. Laban is very tactful, and he, sa- he says that, he doesn't want Jacob to work for him for nothing. He says, I want you, I want you to get something out of this. You're, you're helping around here. Hey, you deserve something. You ever heard people butter you up? That's what he's doing here. He's saying, hey, what can I pay you? What are your wages? Look there in verse 16. It says, and Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Here we're introduced to the other sister, Leah. Laban has been watching Jacob, and he notices that Jacob is uh, uh, he's sweet on Rachel. He notices this. Very, it's, it's very, uh, very uh, evident that he's interested in his daughter Rachel, the younger of the two. And this is the reason why. We'll read on. Verse 17, it says, Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. There's a comparison that's going on here, if you notice this. It says, Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. Basically, what I understand about the Bible, Leah had a great personality. But Rachel was beautiful. Leah was one that, uh, the word tender-eyed means tender-hearted. It also means watery-eyed. But so she was, many commentators I was studying, I was reading, saying that she wasn't, she wasn't so easy on the eyes. She was probably, had a great personality. When you can't say something good about, uh, bad about, uh, good about something, you find something good about them to say, you, uh, you know, if all you have to say is bad, think of something good. So she had a great personality, all right? And so Jacob wasn't, so concerned about her personality he was more concerned about Rachel's beauty so Jacob's in love but then I want you to notice number two the second word is labor labor look there in verse 18 it says and Jacob loved Rachel and said I will serve thee seven years for Rachel thy younger son he's saying I will work I will labor I will do everything I have to 
but I want Rachel. She is the love of my life. We find that Jacob is quite head over heels for Rachel, so when Laban suggested he work for, him, for Jacob, that Jacob work for him, for Jacob had something in mind. He had something that he wanted, and that was Rachel. Laban's knew, Laban knew that Jacob was in love with Rachel, so I don't think this caught him by surprise. He knew what he was going to ask for. And uh, Jacob was willing to work, to serve, to intense labor, if he have to, for seven years for Rachel. Look there in verse 19, it says, And Laban said, It is better that I give her to thee than I should give her to another man. Abide with me. He said, Okay, well, that's a good deal. Let's, let's strike hands. Let's make sure... Let's, this is, you'll serve for seven years. After those seven years are accomplished, I'll give you Rachel. Now, Laban accepts the deal. Look there in verse 20. It says, And Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had for her. Now, this verse tells us one of the loveliest things that is said about Jacob. I mean, frankly, in his early years of Jacob's life, the only uh, uh, appearance of anything good or kind or lovely or noble or beautiful that is said is said in this verse. And it's touching. This is something that is, I mean, you think about it, this should be on a Hallmark card. It says, and Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and it seemed but a few days. I mean, can you see the love that he has for her? You can see... You see Jacob working here, and Laban, Laban had him working hard. He worked out in the cold and the rain, all sorts of weather, but he always had one thought on his mind. At the end of this, I'm going to get Rachel. At the end of this, I'm going to get my prize. There she was to meet him at the end of a hard day. He was desperately in love with her. He didn't mind the toil of taxation of his body. He didn't mind the headaches and the hardships and the heartaches that he... Because finally, payday is coming. Notice there in verse 21, it says, And Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go in unto her. He's saying, Hey, I've done my duty, I've done my job, now give me my wife. Then I want you to notice the third word. We come to the third word, and that's the law. The law. This is where we get the theme of this chapter. In Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. The deceiver is going to be deceived. Look there in verse 22. It says, And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him, and he went in unto her. And Laban gave unto his daughter Leah, Zilpha, uh, his maid for an handmaid. And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is thou this that thou hast done unto me? Did I, I serve thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? And Laban said, It must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Now for me, it was hard for me to understand how in the world he didn't know that this was Leah. And then I started studying the customs and I started studying maybe some of the things that were going on. Maybe it could be that Jacob enjoyed the festivities a little too much. If you don't know what I'm talking, he got a little tipsy. Drank a little too much. Could be that because uh, at the ceremony in those days, a woman also would be veiled, heavily veiled, and so that they could not be seen. And uh, uh, then whenever they went into the wedding chamber, they went into the, uh, the bedroom, they, uh, he could not see. So poor Jacob did not see the girl he was getting until the next morning now I had to, I, I still I, I don't know I, I thought maybe could be that he had too much drink I thought maybe also Leah probably had something to do with this 
She had to have something to, because she knew that, that Jacob wasn't supposed to be marrying to her. She knew the deal. So she was a part of the scam as well. He woke up and it wasn't Rachel, it was Leah. I could only imagine this too. He wakes up, he sees her, and he's like, whoa, what have I done? I mean, now instead of his eyes popping out because of the beauty of Rachel, now his eyes are popping out because of the personality of Leah. And he woke up and it wasn't Rachel. I wonder if he recalled his own father when he, Jacob, had pretended to be the elder. Do you see what's happening here? He deceived his father, and that was the reason he had to leave home. You see, God does not approve of that kind of conduct. The chickens are now coming home to roost. Jacob pretended to be the elder. Notice this. Jacob pretended to be the elder when he was a younger. Now he thinks he's getting the younger, but he's getting the elder. Oh, how the tides have changed. The tables had turned now, and it has become an awful thing to Jacob. He's like, hey... Laban, you've tricked me. You ever been tricked before? Don't feel too good. See, to Jacob, it was a criminal act that Laban had done. But notice how Laban passes it off here. He's an expert at this time, at this type of of thing. He tells Jacob, he says, there was a little matter in the contract, a, a clause in fine print, if you will, which he had forgotten to mention to Jacob. It was a custom in their day, in their time, in their place, that the eldest daughter wasn't to, wasn't, uh, or the youngest daughter wasn't to marry first, that the eldest had to marry first. The youngest daughter could not marry until the eldest daughter was married. Laban is willing, the great guy that he is, he's saying, I'll tell you what, Work for me seven, fulfill her her week. Now, I studied out this week. Some say it was actual seven days. Some say it was seven years. It doesn't matter. He did have to work the seven years, the Bible says. So I don't know if he got after the week because the ceremony of the, uh, the marriage ceremony lasted for a week long. Everybody was there celebrating the marriage and things. So I don't know after that week, her week was fulfilled whether he was able to marry her right away. I'm not sure all that. It doesn't really matter. I know that he had to work another additional seven years for for Rachel. Look there in verse 27. It says, Fulfill her week, and we will give thee this also for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. So Laban made Jacob serve twice as long as he originally agreed to. Seven years flew by because of his love that he had for Rachel. Now, I believe that he loved Rachel enough that it still seemed like, but there was was something different that happened here. This arrangement gave Jacob two wives. Some think, well, this is approved in the Bible. That means God approved it of polygamy. Let's understand something. God does not approve of everything in the Bible. He doesn't approve of everything in the Bible. It's God-breathed. The words are God-breathed, okay? But let me give you an example here. God does not approve of uh, everything uh, for this. For instance, he didn't approve of the devil's lie in heaven, yet it's mentioned in the Bible. He, he didn't approve of David's sin when he sinned with Bathsheba and had Uriah the Hittite killed, yet it's in the Bible and God judged him for it. Both, both of these records are in the Bible. There's a lot of things in the Bible that God didn't agree with, but it was God-inspired, God-inspired uh, word, literally God-breathed. In other words, God said through the writer Moses exactly what he wanted to say. In Genesis 29, God gave an accurate record. Jacob did, not ha- did have two wives, and it tells us the way it came about. That is where inspiration comes in. 
It does not mean that God approved of everything that is recorded in the Bible. Certainly God disapproved of Jacob having more than one wife. May I say to you, this man Jacob had plenty of trouble because of his two wives. And then their handmaids becoming their wives and giving, I mean, all the things that happened. I mean, there was constant trouble because of this. You see, God in his grace forgives our sins. Amen. Aren't you thankful for that? God forgives us our sins when we confess him, but in his government, he allows us to suffer the painful consequences of those sins. Just because I go and I, I, I do something, I commit some sin, and I say, oh God, forgive me, that doesn't mean that there's not going to be consequences. God has forgiven me, yes, but that does not mean there's not consequences for my sins. You say, but I thought God died for my sins, so therefore I don't have to pay for my sins. No, you don't have to pay for the sin of turning him away because Jesus paid the, our righteousness. He made us righteous through him. However, there are consequences to our sins, the sins that we commit, the sins that we, uh, even after we're saved, there's things that we're going to, uh, you know, I believe... Uh, Whenever uh, someone, let's say someone, for instance, someone smokes all their life. Well, uh, 85 years old, they, they get saved and they stop smoking. Does that mean that just because they stopped smoking, they got saved? That means they're, okay, they're not going to have cancer now. No, there's consequences. There's consequences to our sins. And it's not just smoking, it's in our, it's our attitudes. There's a lot of things that could be said here at first when we first get saved we are willing to serve the lord now i want i've said this before and I, I believe it's worth repeating this incident that is recorded reminds me of many christians today at first when we first get saved we are willing to serve the lord I mean, it, it, we are so excited. God is good. I mean, everything is wonderful. We serve him out of a heart of love. We are excited about serving him. But then the first hint of disappointment, heartache, trials, tribulations, headaches, hardships, what we w once done out of love for the Lord, now it's become a taxing and overwhelming to us. You remember when you first got saved? You were willing to, I, as one old preacher said, you were willing to hang over hell with a corn stalk, a dry corn stalk, and squirt the devil in the eye with the squirt gun. I mean, you were just so excited about serving God. There wasn't anything that could stop you. And now you've been saved 20 years. And that zeal, that excitement's kind of weighing down. What happened to it? The taxation. It's become an obligation. It's become our Christian duty instead of why we do it because we love him. Jacob served Laban for the first seven years. It was, it was as a base for him. Can I tell you, in our Christian life, when we're serving God, it should be as days, not seven years, but as those seven years should be as days. I mean, they fly by because we're so excited about serving God. Say, Pastor, that hasn't been me for a long time. I haven't been excited about serving God like you're talking about here. Have a, I could say this. The reason why is because it's not out of love anymore. It's because out of law. You're serving because you feel like you have to. It's our reasonable duty. It's our, we have to do this because I'm obligated to do this to fulfill my, my Christian duties. I why not going back to our first love? Why not getting excited once again, saying, you know what? I want to serve him just out of a heart of love, out of, because I don't care if anybody else is serving him. I don't care if anybody else is excited about it, but I'm going to because I love him. I remember what he's done for me. I know what he's doing for me, and I know what he's going to do for me. Why don't we get back to about loving him and serving him once again. 
See, if you find yourself going through the motions of serving the Lord, you need to remember why you do what you do. And remember why He did what He did. Why did Christ come to this earth? For God so loved the world. I know you've heard me last month, you've heard me talk a lot about love. But you know what I think is missing in most churches today, in most Christian lives today? Is love. It's all about self-centeredness. It's all about me, mine, and it's, it's all about me. You know what I believe we need to get back to? We need to get it back to the spirit and heart of love for others. Love for the Lord. That we want to serve Him because we, we just desire to please Him. You see, we've been bought with a price. We don't belong to ourselves. As a slave, as a servant of Jesus Christ, we belong to him. Therefore, we do not, we do not have any say in the matter. In the military, if you have an officer that's over you, you have someone over you, I don't know a whole lot about order. There are some people that have served in here. I don't know a whole lot about order, but I can tell you a commanding officer tells you to do something. You don't say, no, I'm not going to do that. Why? Because you belong to the government. More importantly than you belong to the government, you belong to God. If you're saved tonight, you belong to him. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are his. Let's get excited once again. Let's find that joy of serving him once again. Not because we have to, but because we desire to. Because I want to serve him. I love him. I want to do for him. Now don't misunderstand me. We don't serve him because in order to be saved. We want to do that because we are saved. Because we do love him. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed tonight. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. If you love me, keep my commandments, the Bible says. Tonight, what can we learn from this lesson? I believe there's a couple things that we can learn. Number one, what you sow, you're going to reap. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap of the flesh. If you sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap of the Spirit. But also, I think what we can learn is we can learn to get back to the heartbeat of God. Get close once again to the Lord. If you're here tonight and you say, Pastor, I just I haven't been as close to him as I should. I've been doing, yes, I've been reading my Bible. Yes, I've been praying. Yes, I've been faithful to church. But there's something missing. You know what that missing link is? Why you're doing it. You're not doing it. You shouldn't be doing it because you have to. You should be doing it because it's a delight. It's a joy. It's a love to do so find yourself doing it out of obligation I want to encourage you to come make that commitment to the Lord Lord help me, give me that desire give me that love back, help me Lord I want you to find a place at the altar tonight if you're here tonight and you say pastor I don't even know for sure if I was to die today I'd go to heaven, I don't even, I don't even know for sure, pastor pray for me won't you come and we can open up God's word and share with you that tonight our Heavenly Father, Lord, you know each situation. You know where every person in this room is. We could put on faces. Lord, we could have the Christian uh, uh, mouthpiece. We can tell people all the, uh, the these and the thous and, and say all the right things at the right time and in the right way. But, Lord, we could be so far from you. And, Lord, tonight I pray that men and women, boys and girls, would find that they would search their heart. And see why they do what they do. Is it out of obligation or is it because they truly love you? God, do a work in our midst, I pray. We'll give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Would you stand to your feet as God has spoke to you? Would you come? Do business with the Lord this evening. God has spoke to your heart about something. I don't know. Maybe it's in your Christian duty. Maybe it's... Maybe it's in your walk with the Lord and your Bible reading, your prayer life, your faithfulness to Him. I don't know how He spoke to you, but I just want you to be obedient and follow His will. 
have thine own way, Lord. you may be seated as you're still in the attitude of prayer. I want to ask you to remember last week I gave you a little boy, 18 month old Knox, Knox Vaughn. He's at Riley Hospital. He's still there. Over the weekend he took a real bad turn to the wars. They had to uh, uh, put him in an induced coma and um, but as of today he's off the ventilator. He's awake. He's, he's not uh, back to him, his old self yet but he's doing much better. Please continue to pray for Knox, Vaughn. Uh, pray for little Knox and the Vaughn family. Then also, there's another family that I'm, uh, that I'm acquaintance with, friends with, uh, just going through a hard time right now. Uh, and I uh, would ask that you would, I don't want to mention names or anything like that, but uh, you, you just pray for this family in need. Um, this time of the year, there's a lot of families that are in need. I, I had a, a friend of mine, a pastor, friend of mine, he, a member in his church, their uh, grandson committed suicide. Uh, so I don't know the names of that family, but would ask that you remember that family as well. This time of the year, is, it's tough on a lot of people. And so you just remember to pray for people. Um, you, you hear someone, go up to people and, and say, hey, how can, I, how can I pray for you today? And I tell you what, it'll change people's attitudes. It'll change people's life. I had few people this week that I two or three people that I went up to and I said, hey, can I pray with you about something? Is there somehow, somehow I could, uh, uh, something I can pray about? And uh, just be an encouragement to them. And I tell you, it will encourage people's lives when they know that people care. All right? Maybe someone else have a prayer request tonight. Prayer request. All right. All right let's go, go, ahead, go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll close as well. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, again, thank you for this opportunity to lift our petitions to you, knowing that you hear our prayers. Lord, I ask that you would continue to be with our church, help us to grow in spirit and in number. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would just uh, help us to draw nigh to you. Lord, help us not to just be uh, uh, do, uh, hearers of your word, but help us to be doers. Lord, help us to love one another. Help us to love you. Lord, I pray that we would be servants of you and seek to please you in all that we say and do. Lord, as I lift up these petitions to you, Lord, knowing that you hear our prayers, if we ask them according to your will, Lord, I think of little Knox as he's just gone through a, a rough last uh, week and a half. Lord, I pray that you would continue putting your healing hand upon him, Lord, for his family, young couple. Lord, I pray that you would just, uh, as I've read testimony this morning of how you have been just so gracious to them there, and they are seeing your mercy and your work in their lives. And, Lord, I thank you for that. And, Lord, I pray that you would continue to do so. Lord, I ask that you would uh, be with this family that I'm uh, close to. Lord, I pray that you would meet the needs there. You know exactly what's going on. Also, for this family that uh, uh, the grandson committed uh, suicide. And, Lord, I pray that you would uh, wrap your loving arms around this family. And, uh, Lord, may they uh, just seek you in all this. Lord, again, thank you for all that you do. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you so much for being here this evening. You are dismissed. Uh, if you have an offering, you can just lay it in the offering plate tonight.